Hello and thanks for checking in to Mr. Ulrich's Land of Biology .com. I am Mr. Ulrich. In this video, we are going to be taking a look at experimental design. We're going to look at a little more detail, more specifically at the controls and variables. Of course, when we're designing an experiment, we need to keep in mind the basic premise of experimentation, the goal of experimentation, which is to show a correlation between two events, two things, to see if there is a cause and an effect relationship between those two events. The design of a good experiment is driven by the good hypothesis that identifies the cause and effect relationship that's uh, being investigated. Uh, of course, you remember in class how I told you about my tiger repellent rock. Um, now, I said that people who are in the same room as the rock uh, would not be attacked by tigers. That makes the proximity to the rock was one of the variables. That was what I was saying was causing someone to not be attacked by tigers. So the uh, attack by tigers or the lack of attack by tigers um, was the effect of being in close proximity to the rock. Of course, if the rock wasn't there, that meant that people were going to be attacked by tigers. Good thing I had the rock in the room. In a scientific experiment, uh, there basically are three different types of variables that have to be accounted for, and we need to be able to describe those variables when evaluating any um, experiment. One of those variables is referred to as the independent variable. Now, sometimes the independent variable is also referred to as the experimental variable. Uh, we can use these two terms interchangeably. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Now, this is the independent variable is the thing that we are predicting to be the cause in our cause and effect relationship. It's the one thing that uh, the experimenters that we set up differently in each one of the treatments. Let's use the tiger repellent rock again as the example. Now in proving you wrong, proving uh, uh, my tiger repellent rock wrong, you said what we should need to do is we have to take the rock and put it in a place with a tiger and a person. And we'll start with me, but of course we're going to do this over and over and over again. With lots of different people and lots of different tigers. Uh, and I said, lo and behold, you know, that uh, hey, only 10% of the people, we'll say, uh, who were put in the large beaker with the tiger and the rock were eaten. Does that prove that uh, the tiger repellent rock works? And, uh, of course, she said no, because uh, we have to see what happens when the tiger repellent rock isn't there. So we set up another beaker. Okay, we put a person... Uh, we put a tiger, and this time we didn't put any rock. So that rock is the one thing that we're allowing to vary from treatment to treatment. All right, so that uh, that that rock becomes the independent variable. Now we have to have one independent variable because if there's anything else that's different between these two treatments, uh, if the tiger is in the rock. Uh, uh, beaker, let's say, uh, were all fed very well, and the tigers in the no rock beaker um, were not fed very well. Now we have two things that are different between each treatment uh, how much the tigers were fed and the presence of a rock. And that leads to we, we can't rely on the results. So only one independent variable. The second type of variable that we need to be able to describe when evaluating an experiment is referred to as the dependent variable. The dependent variable uh, is that thing that we measure as an outcome of the experiment. Right, so uh, those, it's the data set that's uh, gathered. Um, remember what we were gathering as far as data in the tiger repellent rock was, of course, if there were uh, tiger attacks. So this is what I was saying was the effect of not being close to the tiger repellent rock. Uh, an experiment can have lots of different dependent variables, even though it can have one independent variable. Um, that one independent variable could have several outcomes. 
Uh, now we are only looking at one effect of being in close proximity to the rock, but in other experiments, say if we're assessing growth in radish plants, um, you know, maybe we're looking at, say, a particular fertilizer and whether that helps radish plants. There's lots of ways that we can measure uh, helping a radish plant. We can look at how long the leaves grow. We can look at how much the, uh, the roots, how m the mass of the roots. Um, we can look at all kinds of different stuff. Okay, so we've set up our cause and effect relationship by identifying the independent and the dependent variable. Now we need to be able to describe these controlled variables. All right, controlled variables are all of the other conditions of the experiment that are actually held constant from treatment to treatment. So the term right there, variable, is going to cause us some problems because we don't want these things to become variables. They don't vary. What do I mean by this? Well, in our tiger repellent rock experiment, we have to make sure that all of the conditions in the uh, beaker with the rock are the same as the conditions in the beaker without the rock. We have to make sure that the temperature is the same in each one. We have to make sure that the tigers that are in the uh, in the beaker with the rock and the beaker without the rock are both fed the same amount. We can't have one more hungry than the other. Because if that would happen, if we allowed any of those variables, those controlled variables, to actually become variables, to vary, then they would be new independent variables. And we can only have one independent variable. So what we're really saying is uh, all of the other factors that could influence or could have a cause on the effect that we're looking at have been controlled for, is what we say. So um, they're not really variables. They're things that are actually held constant in the setup of each one of the treatments. Every good experiment is going to have a very clearly written procedure, uh, that sequence of steps that was taken in order to carry out that experiment um, so that someone else can go ahead and do the exact same experiment, replicating it, uh, and hopefully, if all goes well, uh, get the same results. Um, each time this is done, we're going to add more experimental data, and that adds reliability uh, because there's uh, less uh, chance for uh, chance variation. Another key part of a good experiment, just to kind of wrap things up here, is a control group. This is the group uh, or treatment that doesn't get the independent variable. This is the normal group, and this is what we're going to compare our experimental results to. Um, without this, we can't really assign a cause and effect relationship. Um, many, many students fall into the trap on a question, on like an exam, uh, when they're asked to describe the controlled group. They have a tendency to describe the controlled variables. These are not the same thing. The control group is a treatment, a uh, treatment that does not get the experimental variable. Um, so the controlled variables are the things that are the same, that are set up to be the same between the control group and the experimental groups. Remember that the control group is the group in which the independent variable is not changed. This is the normal situation. we got to put quote marks around that because quite often our controls are not normal. Um, but it is the comparison. They don't get that independent variable. The controlled variables are the factors that are set up the same in each one of the treatments. Well, we'll stop there for now. Uh, once again, thanks for checking in to Mr. Ulrich's landofbiology.com. You can always uh, go to the website and get my email address and drop me a note if you have any questions, uh, concerns, or comments. Uh, I welcome them and any feedback. Uh, thanks again, and we'll see you in class.